This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 31st, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss why some legislators don't appear to support a PFD even at the POMV 5050 level, although the money to pay it clearly is there this year. Second, we discuss why the approach some take of settling the PFD now and deal with the remainder of the fiscal issues later on isn't realistic. And third, we discuss why campaign finance issues should be an integral part of the election issues being addressed by both the House and the Senate this year. Finally, as you will note about halfway through the podcast, we ran into some technical issues this week. But by resorting to the old school approach of calling in, we overcame and finished. And now, let's join Michael. Well, Brad, let's uh, let's dive into the weekly top three here. And you're going to start off this morning with some, well, I don't know if it's good news or bad news or just news news, but this uh, this idea of the POMV 5050, it seems like some of these jokers just feels like, oh, that's just way too, the peasants shouldn't have quite that much money this time. We shouldn't raise their expectations. We should give them what we deem to be fit, and they should not expect more than a single farthing than we give them. Uh, am I stretching it here or what? You're doing your best Scrooge imitation. Yes. No, I, you're not. You're, you're not. Uh, you're not stretching it, and and it's bad news. Um, there is an article uh, that Andrew Kitchenman from uh, Alaska Public Media did, that's uh, up on the uh, KTOO and on the Alaska Public Media uh, websites uh, about uh, about the current uh, fiscal situation, what's what's starting in the legislature. And it's got a quote from Bryce Edgman, who, because he's rules chair and because he's the de facto speaker of the House, uh, is, is an important quote. And it says this, Edgman said, this year's dividend will lead to political pressure for the future. And that creates expectations we need to grapple with in ensuing years, depending on whatever we do with the permanent fund dividend, he said. And I want to point that out because that's what drives what happens in this building. And it has driven what's happened in this building for some time now. This, would, to the, the critical part of this, this year's dividend will create expectations that we need to grapple with in the ensuing years, depending on whatever we do with the permanent fund dividend. What Bryce is saying is we can't, even though the money's there, even though using, even though with oil prices up and, and with the governor proposing to use uh, federal COVID relief funds to, as he can, to help or as the state can to help supplement uh, uh, general revenues, even with the money being there, Bryce is suggesting that they shouldn't uh, uh, make the dividend quote too high uh, because it will create expectations and political pressure for the future. And I just I, hey, that, that's sort of a stunning statement. You shouldn't comply with the statute. You shouldn't comply with. Uh, with uh, with a use that that the legislature is not repealed, uh, you shouldn't comply with the use that uh, that that's in the statute um, because it may raise expectations of future years. And the concern that they have in future years is when the federal money's gone, when the COVID relief money's gone, and if oil prices go back down, as the futures market tells us that they will, that they're going to be stretched in in terms of 
of uh, balancing the budget. The only reason uh, Dunleavy's budget balances is because he uh, he assumes a a, a very very low uh, inflation factor in future years. So what they're concerned about is not having enough money in future years, and that using Bryce's statement or 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 looking at Bryce's statement, that's beginning to drive what they do on the PFD this year, right? Uh, and uh, and beginning to drive them down. You you can see other statements. Other legislators have made about, oh, we should be, for example, Stedman, uh, that we should be saving money. We should be putting money in the bank, that, that you can't rely on this year's oil prices to continue. Uh, and so we need to be replenishing savings. And those are all variations on the theme of, yeah, we got the money. Yeah, you know, oil prices are up. And yeah, we're, we're able to use COVID relief funds to, to offset uh, some general revenue spending. Yeah, we got the money. But but we don't want to spend it uh, on PFDs. We want to put it to some other purpose. This is a legislature who's not had the votes to repeal the PFD statute, but they're nevertheless, you know, in, in, in bits and pieces, they're nevertheless all saying, a number of them are saying the same thing, which is, yep, statute's still in the books, but we don't want to comply with the statute. And so we're going to, you know, come up with various budget tricks to, uh, uh, to put that money someplace else. And we definitely don't want to give them enough money that, oh, my God, the next year they may have expectations. And that makes our fight to take back more of the PFD even harder because we've given them a big one. They'll they'll cry because we got to cut it back to a smaller one next year if we give them a big one this year. That's essentially it's not what even a, It's not even a big one, Michael. I mean, the statutory PFD this year, uh, 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 this coming fiscal year, uh, based upon the the permanent fund corporation's own analysis, the, the statutory PFD is somewhere in the neighborhood of four thousand dollars. What Dunleavy is proposing is a PFD in the neighborhood of what twenty five hundred dollars, something like that, uh, yeah. you, using POMV fifty fifty. And and Bryce is calling even a twenty five and and Bert and others are even calling a twenty five hundred dollar PFD a big one. Um, so it's just, I mean, w- what they've done is they've become locked in on on this thought that that they shouldn't give any more than, than the average PFD that's, you know, that, that's, that's accrued over the years, somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,500 to $1,600. And that should be their cap as opposed to whatever the statute says or, you know, whatever uh, uh, Dunleavy has proposed in terms of POMB 5050. It's, it, it, they're, they're entirely wiping a statute off the books um, that they can't repeal. They don't have the votes to repeal, but they're entirely wiping it off the books by just ignoring it. Well, they're basically saying, this is our slush fund. We shouldn't give any more than we have to out of it, and we shouldn't raise any expectations that they should get any more of it than we deem necessary. I mean, this literally is the ultimate expression of the politician's disease. We know better than you how to spend your money, you poor, poor, pitiful children. We will tell you what you need. I mean, am I wrong? No, no. Even in a year, even in a year where I, nobody can come up, nobody can come up with the argument that we don't have the money. That's not the argument this year, because they do have the money. The argument this year is, well, we don't want to do it this year because that means you'd expect it next year, or you'd expect it in future years, or we don't want to do it because we want to create the savings account so that so that we can continue spending in future years. Right. Uh, if oil prices if oil prices go back down, even though we have the money, even though the statute says it, even though we don't have the votes to repeal the statute, we, we we're not going to we don't want to give you the money uh, uh, because we want it for uh, we want it so that 61 of us, 60 legislators plus the governor can decide who benefits from that money in the state as opposed to, you know, 600, 650,000 Alaskans who would otherwise receive it being able to decide. Uh, who benefits from that money? Well, don't worry, Brad. They've got it all covered. They know better than us. They know how I, we should take it. Yeah, but it's just it 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 is it is infuriating. Yeah, I want to use the word outrage. It is infuriating, but I want to use the word outrageous too because it's if you don't have the votes to repeal the statute, then, then do something like the statute tells you to do. Hashtag, uh, hashtag follow the damn law. That's what it should be. That should be the hashtag. Follow the damn law right now. If you're not going to, like you said, the the court said they could, they could, they, that they didn't have to follow it, but they should repeal it so it doesn't sit there on the books because it just looks bad at this point. But they know they can't get the votes 
to change the law. So yeah, it's uh anyway. Bryce has given away the given away the the deal uh, uh, going into this legislature, which is yep, money's there, not going to do it. Uh, at least the House isn't going to do it. Uh, and if the House doesn't, it takes both of them to do it. So if the House right. isn't going to do it, uh, then we're uh, then we're up. Even though the money's sitting there, even though this year the money's sitting there, they don't have the claim of we can't we don't, can't afford it. We don't have it to spend. Even though uh, the money's sitting there, uh, they're trying to avoid it. Well, again, the most interest, the most interesting thing about that whole discussion of what you just said was the fact that they basically admit that they just don't want to raise the expectation of the populace that they should see these dividends for coming years because, as you said, they want to put it into savings and they want to they want to bogart it uh, for the future. And you know, we don't, we, you know, we just we just don't want to do that. We don't want to create expectations that we have to grapple with in ensuing years. Um. Wow. I mean that that if that it, doesn't interest, interfere, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, the interesting use of the 1960s phrase. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but but it's accurate. I mean they 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 want to. I mean they they want to keep that money for themselves. Yeah. As opposed to just distributing it to Alaska families. Yep. It and, is. Uh, it's just. I mean, <laughs> it's the piggy bank. I mean that's what they want. They want it. They want it. They want it to be their puddle of money and nobody else's. I got to tell you, I am rapidly reaching that point in my life where I'm looking at this, and I'm seeing that everything comes back to that arrogance of the politician. That somehow, some way, they know better than you how to spend your money, run your life, do the things, and that really is just the epitome of it to me. But I mean, that that, that really is the problem. They feel like they can't trust Alaskans to spend their money to budget their stuff, that the money needs to be in government hands because government does better than the private citizenry. I mean, it's all this, it's just, it, it's, it's uh, infuriating is the word that I use because that's how I feel. I feel like every time you hear these guys talk, you're getting the proverbial pat on the head at what a good little boy or girl you should be in listening to them. Yeah, and 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 the thing that's, the thing that's even more Infuri- infuriating about it, Michael, is they've got a statute that tells them what to do, right? And and they can't repeal it. They don't have the votes to repeal it. They claim yeah. they conflicted it by another statute, but you know, as as I've shown time and time and time again, there's not a conflict between the two. They just there's there's a law on the books that was passed by the body back in the 1980s. They don't have the votes to repeal it now, but they just continue to ignore it. That that makes this even worse. It's not, it's not just, we know better how to spend your money than you do. It's, and we're going to ignore a statute, ignore a statute uh, that's on the books that we can't repeal. We're going to ignore a statute uh, in order to continue to do that. Right. Exactly. Well, and that's exactly the thing is that we know better than you, but we, we ignore the law at the same time um, and have no, uh, and, and I don't see, I don't see any of that changing with the, with the players that we have in there right now, because they're all part of that old guard. I mean, the Bryce Edgemans, the Stedmans, the Von Imhoffs, the Stutes. I mean, these are people that they want everything to continue in the lane that it's going right now. As you said, they're setting things up for the fights in the years to come. They know that this PFD battle, and I think that they're intentionally stringing the PFD battle out so that they won't lose access to that pot of money. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, they're stringing the P- PFD battle out until people will give up. Yeah, and that's that's basically what's going on year by year by year. And now and now even a year where they've got the money, where they don't have the ability to claim, oh, there's no money to do this. Even a year where they have the money, they're uh, they're, they're going to string it out. Yeah, no, they're going to they're going to do it. And they just it's um, it's it's again, infuriating is the word that I'm using, but uh, um, it's it's just right. Uh, again, follow the damn law. That should be the that should be the hashtag that everybody's running right now. Uh, it, it's either that or change it. Change the law. They know that there's no political will to do that, and they know that if they get into that fight, they'll lose. And I think that's uh, <clears throat> that's that's the important part. Which leads us into number two, Brad. The fiscal policy working group recognized that we had to deal with this stuff holistically. That we couldn't peek it apart a piece at a time. I mean that was the that was the consensus of all these conservative, liberal, centrist, everybody that was a part of this. It was a unanimous thing that said 
We have to deal with it holistically. We can't pick it apart a piece at a time. And nobody's paid attention to that. Yeah, the, the, there was an editorial uh, in the Anchorage Daily News over the weekend by the permanent fund defenders. Uh, uh, Joe Geldorf uh, uh, wrote it. Uh, Juanita Casillas uh, uh, co-wrote it. Um, and and the, the crux of it comes down to this. It says, Alaska's citizens and their dividend must be addressed first, not government spending, taxes, or any other issue related to solving the fiscal situation of the state. In a lot of my discussions with about the PFD with various people, non, non-legislators, uh, outside the le- legislature, it, that's the position that, that, that many take. We deal with the PFD first, and then we'll deal with the other stuff. And as, as you and I have talked on the show a number of times, Uh oh, I think we lost Brad. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, everything's working, and then nothing works. If it's not one thing, it's another. All right, Brad. Number two. Uh, sorry about that. Number two. Uh, the holistic approach to fixing the PFD. Go. It's all you. Yeah. Here's the deal. So, in in an op-ed over the weekend, uh, the permanent fund defenders, uh, Joe Geldorf and uh, Juanita Casillas. Uh, wrote an op-ed uh, defending the PFD as they should, uh, but they included it, they included a sentence that says this: Alaska's citizens and their dividend must be addressed first, not government spending, taxes, or any other issue related to solving the fiscal uh, situation of, I, of a state of our state. I've I've had conversations with people outside the legislature about the PFD, and that's very often the position they take. Uh, uh, that you deal with the PFD, then we'll deal with everything first. That's not how politics works uh, in a situation like this. I mean, it's what we would like. It's what would. It's what those who focus on the PFD uh, want. Uh, but it's not how politics works. And and there's no better evidence of that that when that when the the legislature formed the the fiscal working group and included legislators from the left, the center, and the right. Uh, ben Carpenter, uh, Mike Shower, Shelley Hughes uh, were on uh, were on the committee. Uh, uh, Mike Fox was, uh, was an alternate. The conclusion of that effort, which I think was a very good effort, laid out a great game plan going forward. The conclusion of that effort was this: the fiscal policy working group believes the legislature must pass a comprehensive solution. Fiscal policy working group members do not support addressing only one or two issues to the exclusions of others. The fiscal policy working group believes addressing these issues as a comprehensive solution solves not only a fiscal challenge, but a political challenge as well. That's the reality on the ground. Right. We're either going to solve all these issues together in a comprehensive package, or we're not going to get any of them solved. And and I think the, the problem with those who focus on the PFD first, you know, give me my PFD and then we'll talk about other things. The problem with those who focus on the PFD first is they're using up energy that would be better be served trying to get to a comprehensive solution, a, a, a solution that could pass. I mean, we're just, we're just, when we focus on only the PFD, give me my PFD and then we'll talk about other things. We're, we're just we're diverting the issue off in a way that's not going to get to a solution. It's satisfying for the people who discuss it. It's satisfying for the people who want to bang on the table and you know hold their breath and say my way or my way or the highway. Right. But it's not going to get us to a political solution. It's not going to get us a PFD. Well, and I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier that there are members of this uh, cadre and they're the business as usual cadre who definitely want to string this out. They want to pull it apart one piece at a time because they know that nothing will get done if we only take it one piece at a time. And so they'll be able to continue. They, I mean, they, they, you know, we keep saying, well, the permanent fund is taking up all the oxygen in the room and that's the one thing. And, and we're fighting about it every year. And they're like, yep. And that's how we like it because then we could still take it. Then we could still decide the issue is never, is never finalized. It's always in doubt. And that's how we like it. Yeah, that's a great observation. I mean, those who are those who are taking the position PFD first are actually working in concert with those with Bryce and others who want to, who want to string this out, uh, who don't want to get to a comprehensive solution, who want the cutting PFD cuts uh, to be the only solution, uh, who want to you know redirect that money into the general budget. So they're coming at it entirely different ways. I mean, 
I mean, those who want to you want the PFD first are are legitimately and truly trying to defend the PFD. Bryce is not, but the end result is they're ending up in the same place, which is not putting together a package that addresses as the as the fiscal policy working group said, as Mike Shower, Ben Carpenter, Shelley Hughes, Mike Prox all said, is not addressing the politically uh, achievable solution of uh, putting together a comprehensive package. Yeah, no, absolutely. Brad, we're down to the last minute. Give me your final thoughts on number two here. Well, number two is we, we've got it. People need to spend their energy on what's politically achievable. And what's politically achievable, as the Fiscal Policy Working Group uh, set out, is a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive package. That's where we need to focus our effort, not on I want my way first, and then I'll, and then I'll consider what everybody else wants. Let's talk about number three, which is the uh, campaign finance rules. Uh, you wanted to dive into this a little bit. Talk to me about this. What's, uh, what's so important here? So there's, a, there's an article that uh, Nat Hertz did in the ADN, um, and, and the headline is, Without action from lawmakers, triple the cash flow can triple the cash can flow into Alaska campaigns this year. And it's about the, the consequences of a Ninth Circuit decision that essentially uh, set aside throughout uh, Alaska's uh, long, longstanding uh, campaign finance or campaign restrictions on, uh, on state, uh, state election campaigns. Some people think that's okay. Some people think unlimited money coming into the state and the state campaigns, governor, the governor's campaigns and the legislature campaigns um, uh, is okay. The federal campaigns are still governed by the federal rules. So that's not, that's not an issue. What we're talking about are the, are the state campaigns. Some people think that's okay. But I got to tell you, I'm, I'm very concerned about this and very concerned about what money can do, especially in the context of the open primary rank choice voting uh, uh, situation that we're going into. There was a there was a um, uh, an article in the New York Times over the weekend. Uh, the headline of was, was what what we've learned about dark money, and one of the conclusions is this: Dr dark money is driving a privatization of politics, funding ads, voter turnout, and lawsuits. Things left to campaigns and parties. One entity on the left, the 1630 fund, spent 410 million dollars in 2020. Oof. More than the Democrat National Committee, Ugh. and and this article goes goes into great detail talking about how it's Democrats, frankly, who are using the dark money opportunity uh, to begin to drive campaigns. We frankly saw that during the during the uh, uh, the, the ballot measure on ranked choice voting. Right, uh, uh, we saw a heck of a lot of. of of progressive money come into the come into the state st sitting behind that, as you said before, as we've talked about before, Alaska is a cheap date. It doesn't it doesn't take much money to begin to influence elections in Alaska, and opening up the campaign finance rules or opening up the campaign finance limits in the way the Ninth Circuit has done, uh, I think uh, uh, portends uh, very uh, uh, problematic things going forward uh, for uh, for the state. And and I see that, you know, we were talking about that, that there's actual conversations and tapes of them discussing this uh, whole ballot measure, too, and everything else, and they're likening Alaska to a cheap date. I mean, that's essentially what they said. They could spread just a few million dollars around the state and get something like this pass. And uh, and, and that's that, that's exactly it. We saw that. I mean, seven million bucks spread around a, a, a state of 700,000 people. They got their they got their referendum passed or their ballot measure passed, and now they're going to use that as a yardstick to go to other states and do the same thing. Well, not only other states, but come back into Alaska. I mean, I I, I, I think you can see a pattern that there's additional money that's going to come back into Alaska in the governor's race and in the and in the legislative races. Frankly, to me, this is as important an elections issue as anything that Senator Shower has got on his agenda. For uh, Senate State Affairs, I think this issue getting the—I mean, the Ninth Circuit said the the rules we had uh, weren't constitutional, but it didn't say any rules aren't constitutional, and and other states have rules that that limit their financing. And so I I think as important as anything else that Mike Shower is looking at right now, he ought to be looking at campaign finance limits and reinstituting, reestablishing. Uh, reasonable, uh, consistent with the Ninth Circuit decision, reasonable campaign finance uh, rules going forward. 
Well, I, I, w- I couldn't agree more. I mean, when you look at this and you realize that a lot of this money, and that's one of the interesting things is the ballot measure two did that, that nobody really noticed was they opted out. Ballot measures can still collect. Un- they keep talking about how we're going to take dark money out of politics with all this dark money we're spending. And oh, by the way, ballot measures in the future, they're exempted from all these dark money regulations. So you could still, I mean, again, it's just, I mean, nobody bothered to look at the fine print. Yeah, and and you know between that and the Ninth Circuit decision, I think we've got a we've got a, a situation where we just opened ourselves up to a, a substantial influence of, a, of of you know unlimited campaign finance. We're taking we're taking the choice out of people's hands, and we're putting it in in the hands of those uh, with money. And as we've talked about on the show before, those with money don't want uh, PFDs. They want to convert. Uh, uh, the the permanent fund dividends to uh, to their purpose by by avoiding taxes. So yeah. I think it's just a I think it's just a, a a very bad situation that that the Ninth Circuit has set up by by taking away our campaign finance. We can put new restrictions in place, and I think that uh, the Mike Showers uh, State Senate Affairs Committee ought to be putting that on the agenda as high as anything else uh, that they're looking at for election reform. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest. Final thoughts here, Brad, 40 seconds or so. Well, um, I, 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 it's going to be an interesting session with uh, with the legislature. I think they, I hope that we continue to press forward on the PFD, but we've got to do it uh, in the context of, uh, of an overall comprehensive solution. We're just wasting effort if we keep going down the PFD first and then we'll consider the other stuff uh, uh, approach. Well, I, I and I and I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that more Alaskans uh, are paying attention to this, and uh, and you know we'll we'll see that hopefully we'll be able to to make people wake up and change their minds. Brad Keithley, thank you, my friend. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with you. I apologize for all the technical stuff this morning. I'm not sure exactly where the problem lies, but it's probably with me. So I I, I apologize. But thanks for coming on board, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.